Women have struggled for decades for equality and to break through the glass ceiling to obtain leadership positions in the workplace. But women of color face additional obstacles in bringing their voices to the C-suite. According to a report conducted by the American Association of University Women last year, black women are subject to discrimination along two dimensions, being underrepresented in leadership roles in both the public and private sectors and earning less than their black male counterparts. Black women represent just 8% of the private sector workforce and a dismal 1.5% of senior leadership. To discuss these challenges and the current attention on diversity, please welcome Fortune's Ellen McGirt with Jamie Claire Flaherty, Tracy Patterson, and Barry Williams. Welcome, welcome. Hello, everyone. It's great to be back with you. Ah. So this panel um, springs from the story of the same name, The Black Ceiling, that um, I recently reported that did a bit of grim duty. Um, it highlighted a deeply disappointing element of an otherwise celebratory list and celebratory moment, the 2017 Most Powerful Women list. There's only one black woman on it this year, the incredible Anne Marie Campbell from Home Depot. And while there was an uptick in um, women as CEOs, which is such an important indicator of success, 32 in CEO jobs from, up from 21 in 2016, and we've lost a couple along the way, there are now no black or African American women in the top spot in the Fortune 500 cohort. So while there are clearly cracks developing in the glass ceiling, increasingly for black women, the ceiling is starting to feel like cement. So we are going to tackle this issue with a simple yet utterly challenging question. What is it about black women, African Americans specifically, and their unique experiences that makes um, traditional inclusion and diversity efforts um, overlook them? So Barry Williams, I'm gonna start with you, if I may, since you contributed to the story, and thank you, and you continue to contribute to the race ahead world every day with your activities. Um, if you, we could start with your take, and, and what is missing in inclusion that black women are being left out? I think a, a big piece of it is, I think even just in my own experience by watching my, my mother and my grandmother, uh, black women have always learned how to do more with less mm -hmm. um, and for less, and that's the problem, is, uh, you know, I, I tend to believe that there is a black woman proverb that's essentially F it, I'll do it. And that seems to be a motto that we live by. <laughs> That's not how she said it in the green room. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I, I could say a little bit more in the green room. But, um, but yeah, that's essentially our, our motto, I feel, as a, as a collective. But the problem is that if you get used to doing more for less and you do more with less, that's how people treat you. And I think the issue with that is that that oftentimes makes sure that our value is, is undervalued. So speaking of an F it, I'll do it myself moment, take us back to Facebook and your, your brainstorm around the, diversity, the supplier diversity network because it was a solution that I hadn't quite considered. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my dad is, he's an entrepreneur. My mom was a school teacher. And I think oftentimes black women also can be very safe in their careers. And so my mother and grandmother uh, were school teachers 40 years, you know, did the retirement thing and just didn't even understand the idea that I didn't have a pension. So the notion that watching an entrepreneur that my dad was, was okay, well he's building a business himself. And I thought strategically it made sense to incorporate a supplier diversity function which includes women, minorities, LGBTQ, and veterans. So I wanted it to be inclusive of the main ERGs Facebook had, mm -hmm. but also gives access and economic opportunity to groups that are not necessarily reflected in the employee percentages. But it was a complimentary program because not everybody wants to work for another company and not everybody you know, wa wants to, to work for someone else. They wanna build their own business and provide their own community with opportunity. So Jamie Claire, I'm gonna get you into the mix here and ask the question that I know that you're asked more than any other question as you walk through your day. How are Barack and Michelle doing? <laughs> I'm besties. Um, I hear they're great. Understood. Please tell them we said hello, all of us. Yes. I will. I'll relay the well wishes. So I know the Obama Foundation is just now being born, but you are playing a critical role in the inclusive 
part of it. Could you walk us through what that's been like and what you hope to achieve? I mean, to be sappy, it's been like the greatest honor of my life. I actually um, received the offer on Inauguration Day 2017. So it was in many ways uh, kismet. Wow. Over the course of the year, um, I've helped in our early stages uh, build out our diversity policies. So that's our spending policies, our hiring. Um, we're all, like I said, early days. Um, and this is a work that we'll be doing in phases, but we're being very intentional. Um, one of the pleasures of my job is getting to work with our advisory board, um, which is called the Inclusion Council. Something that we didn't have to do. Remember, we're a private foundation. Um, president hasn't even been out of office a full year. But even before he left office, he decided he wanted to uh, reach out to experts who devoted their lives to diversity in every spectrum, very much like you just said. So not just black, brown, veterans, rights, um, accessibility rights. So we have a 19-member advisory board that essentially holds us accountable and gives us great ideas. You know, it's like I was saying, um, the president, sure, he was brought to this um, by virtue of being the first African-American president of the United States, but it doesn't by any means uh, say that he's going to be an expert in supplier diversity or procurement. So it's up to us to be intentional in how we do that. So Tracy, um, many of you are familiar with Accenture's audacious goal to make sure there's 50-50 gender parity by 2025. So what I didn't realize was a key, what a key role you were playing in developing and implementing that strategy. Could you talk a little bit about how big your job actually is and what are some of the barriers to black women's success that you're seeing? Absolutely. So I think it's really important, particularly when your company is uh, as creative and innovative as Accenture is. I mean, we truly believe that diversity is going to make us stronger, more creative, more innovative. It's really a business imperative. It's not just an action that we're taking. And so um, through thought leaders like Ellen, who inspires me every day. Ellen with, Shook. Ellen Shook. I also inspire you every day, but you meant a different one. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and so as many of you know, Ellen Shook is our, our chief HR officer, and you know through her many things that she's launched, like inclusion starts with I, um, being truly human, um, you know, being able to bring your authentic self to work, you know, helps to demystify this whole process of being an African American woman at work, right, and allows you to truly bring the best of who you are. So I think some of those things are necessary to break down all the barriers, right. but then it personally inspired me you know, to look inside of my business and figure out where can I make a difference. And so just in this year alone, I really tried to diversify the way we recruit and source t women technologists. And in less than six months, we were able to bring in over 500 women in a time where people think that that's unheard of, right? Because those skills just don't exist. Right. And we've also launched employee referral programs so that we can find other networks of women to bring in house. And so I'm really inspired to roll out that strategy across all of our businesses to try to amplify the effects that we've already started. So here's what worries me about next gen women, because it's, an, it's a specific role, part of your life. You're worried about older relatives and parents. You're worried about young children. And when you're, a, when you're a black woman, when you're running a black family, the pressures are very different. So to build on, on Sally's remarks, the wage gap for, for black women professionals, we make 60 cents on the, on the dollar that white women make. You know, you think about the, the wealth gap, you can be, um, the, the average black family has $11,000 $11, in wealth, where the average white family, middle class white family, is $134,000 in, in, in net wealth. So when you think about the complexities of you know, what's happening in the streets and what's happening in, in policy and um, Disparities in health, disparities in education. Our lives are complicated. And how can we begin to start thinking about managing for that in big organizations? You have to ask for what you want. Um, I'm an attorney, and so I feel like everything is negotiable. <laughs> and I, I think it, it certainly should be. So if you see that a black woman has an inordinate amount of talent, and there's somewhere that you want to guide her or that she wants to go, it would be great if you made it a little bit easier for her to do that. Yeah. Um, that could be flexible hours. That could be um, maybe relocating to different cities. Right. But I also feel that it's, it's on us to actually ask for what it is that we want. And that can be daunting sometimes because you don't know how that's going to be received. Right. Yeah, and I think, uh, Ellen, it's also important. So black women sit at this intersection 
of both race and gender. Right. And um, if we think every day about the challenges as a woman we experience, right, being underestimated, trying to raise our voice, this is amplified when you add African American on top of that. So sometimes uh, organizations have uh, programs and things that try to lay a surface around women programs, but underneath that layer are several different complexities. And so I think the first step is really understanding that that other layer exists, yeah. and then trying to have helpful programs to unearth things that are helpful for, for African American women. Well, the blanket thing of just a, a women's program generally is not usually going to, is not gonna do it. It's not a one size not fits all. Yeah. And I think it's, it's interesting, we talked about, um, you know, if you, if you see something, say something. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes that, that could be seen as a hindrance for black women or, or a negative because if I'm already walking in and I'm five foot 10 and I have big curly hair and then all of a sudden I'm telling you what you just said about someone who's not in the room is inappropriate, well now all of a sudden I'm aggressive as opposed to, to saying something to, to stand up for someone else. So you also have to be careful, careful in terms of reading the room and understanding your audience. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's interesting, though, because I was thinking that as I was preparing for this, if you see something, say something, but from the angle of um, those who maybe aren't black women. Mm -hmm. So if you see us, you know, maybe ask, how are we doing? Maybe ask, do you need, you know, something? So that we aren't, the onus isn't always on us to um, figure out a way to toe this, you know, line. Um, I think that's important for, for anyone in the workplace. Uh, we should all be trying to think of each other, right? Golden rule. But it would be very helpful if we had allies yeah. that we could look to. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd like to open it up for questions, but I've asked um, my new best friend, Lauren Antonoff, formerly of Microsoft and currently of GoDaddy, to, to kick us off. There she is. She's waving. To kick us off, as the mic is coming to you now, um, with some things that she learned recently about intersectionality at Grace Hopper, because it really, it was so wonderful and so brave. So I was recently at the uh, Technical Executive Forum uh, at Grace Hopper, and I've been doing a lot of work in diversity for years, and I've always uh, been very proud of it, and sort of, you know, I would say things like, you know, there's no such thing as a unisex shirt. You know, that's a man's shirt. And uh, uh, at this forum, there was an amazing panel, uh, largely of African-American women, outstanding leaders, and they made the point that if you're doing diversity for women, generically, that generic shirt is a white woman's shirt. That is, those are white women's programs. And that was a huge wake up call that something that I've been doing and very passionate about, maybe I'm doing it wrong and I need to find a new way of doing it that is inclusive, that takes into account that women aren't just one flavor of women. There's all sorts of flavors. And uh, so I'm excited to, uh, figure out the new way of doing it that really is intersectional and inclusive. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So in the back, all the way in the back, and then back here. And I want to make sure that we leave time for you to comment on all that. Hi, I'm Dee uh, from Xerox Canada. Question for you on the youth, you know, the young black females coming up and the, what they're seeing in the world versus what, say, I'm in my 40s, what ladies in their 40s, um, African-American women would have experienced. Are the stats changing based on desire to ascend, build careers? I, uh, and also, are they experience, what are the young conscious biases they're experiencing? Are they any different? I'm just curious if there's been any research around this or if you have any feedback around it. Because obviously I'm hopeful that it's going in a new direction um, uh, and the opportunities are growing. So I can, I can start, Ellen. Uh, so in, in the latest research, there, there actually are trends that are saying that more young girls are graduating with STEM-based degrees, more are entering into fields like engineering, computer science, and there are lots of organizations now. So for example, there's um, Black Girls Code, right. who is it, the founder, Kimberly Bryant, is incubating this next set of women leaders. So I think that um, the democratization of access to tech is there. Uh, role models you know, are, are now starting to emerge and have a voice. And so it's up to us, though, to challenge organizations to think broadly about programs that help to you know, matriculate them into the organization, whether it be through internships or apprenticeships, 
right? Because it's, it's really translating what they're learning in school to how to be successful in the professional environment. But we're, we're clearly losing people from individual contributor to the yeah. first level. And that's, you know, the, the, the fortune data is yeah. grim. There's 2% middle managers, the people we're going to be shoving into the high potential pool. The 2% are black women. It's the lowest number of any racial cohort, with the exception of, of Native Americans, who deserve their own panel as well. So I'm, I'm concerned that this is, this is a sponsorship issue. This is a, an allyship issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not due to lack of desire. So I wouldn't say that there's a lack of desire in women uh, over 40, or, and, and certainly not women under 40. I think the issue is more access, um, and a lot of that comes through sponsorship. So I think a, a key thing um, that our, our new friend in the back learned at the panel is, is, is entirely true, is you should be willing to be the ally for people who are not in the room. And oftentimes, you ladies will be in the rooms that we're not invited in, and we would need the help and, and would like the help to have, have our voice heard in that room. And I think a lot of that is, you know, we just need the sponsorship. And the sponsorship is, is what can be key. And I would challenge us to look at it like a journey, right? Because we're not talking about just this generation, but we're talking about millennials, Gen X. I mean, these are women in the next five to 10 years that'll be entering the workforce. Right. And so we need to solve for that whole continuum. I do think what's important on that front, um, I had the benefit of two wonderful bosses before I joined the Obama Foundation, John Rogers and Melody Hobson, who um, are CEO and president, respectively, of Aerial Investments in Chicago. And John would always say, generational wealth. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If you could get not just a job, but a career, mm -hmm. and then that gets you a house, which is an asset, and then that gets you, right. you know, a, a staple in your community and a stake in the ground for your family for generations. Right. I, the black community is still struggling with that, if we could yes. really rebuild um, and, and get that, um, figure that out. That's why diversity, um, supplier diversity makes a difference. It builds generational wealth. That's why people advocating for systemic change makes a difference. Someone in the back there? Is that Karen, is that you? Hey. It Hi. is, hello. Hi, Ellen. So Ellen asked me to mention this just simply because my name's Karen Ulrich Stacy. I'm the founder of a company called Diversity Lab, and I work mainly in legal. And in legal, we have an issue of 50-50 women and men coming out of law school. But when you get to the upper echelons of law firms, it's only 16% women. It's even worse when you talk about Latina and black and LGBTQ. So one of the things that we've done, Ellen was nice enough to write it about it, is we took a page from the playbook, the NFL playbook, with the Rooney Rule. How many of you have heard of the Rooney Rule? Yeah. Great. So essentially, it's interviewing at least one minority candidate for all head coach positions. So we looked at that, we did the research on it, and found out that it worked pretty well the first five years. And then it started to wane in the second 10. So we took some research from that, and we created something called the Mansfield Rule. And the idea behind the Mansfield Rule is to take the burden off of you to ask yeah. for a governance role, or to be hired or to be promoted and to put that on the organization. So there are 44 law firms that are participating. 30% of their candidate pools for all hiring, all governance elections, all governance appointments, and all promotions have to consider minorities and women. I'm gonna to have to have you bookmark that there because it's an amazing tool and it's smart thinking and thank you for pulling it together. We only have a few seconds left, so I wanna make sure the panel has the last word. Super lightning round. We're going to write down the line here. One piece of advice, something that made a difference to you or that will make a difference to the allies in the room. Go. <laughs> My grandmother always said, expect what you accept. So you teach people how to treat you. Role model the change that you would like to see in the workplace. And I think it's both and. Um, diversity is not a zero sum game. There's enough work to go around. Beautiful. Thank you to the panel, and thank you for all of you for being such great allies.